Hey friends, Pastor Josh here again with the Ascending Life Podcast. And thank you so much for joining me for another episode. And we have a good one today. You know, we've had some great conversations all together. Uh, Today is no exception. I am really blessed and honored to have John Harris with me today. Uh, John Harris uh, is now uh, a, a leading voice in the church defending the faith. And he has a podcast. I encourage you to check it out. It's called Conversations That Matter. You can look it up on YouTube or Apple Podcasts. Um, John also has a couple books that we're going to talk about a little bit later in the interview. So I want to encourage you to take a look at those as well. But I want you to settle in and get ready for a really great conversation uh, with myself and John Harris on the issue of pastoral integrity. Yes, and that is such an important issue, especially today when there are so many lies and deceit uh, and you know false doctrine really infiltrating the church. We need to be established and prepared in our hearts and our minds. And I think that this conversation is going to be a good one to get us thinking in the right direction. So settle in and enjoy this conversation with John Harris. Well, hey friends, uh, Pastor Josh here again, and thank you for joining me with another You Ask segment of our uh, Ascending Life podcast. Uh, As I mentioned before, I have a special guest, John Harris, with me. I gave you guys his website and his podcast a little earlier. I want you to check that out, as well as uh, a couple of his books that he's written that we're going to actually talk about a little bit later in this segment. But uh, John has been a refreshing, a breath of fresh air, really, in this day and age. I've really admired his a willingness to use his intellectual honesty and biblical clarity to bring uh, a sense of courage and strength to a lot of the issues we're seeing infiltrate the church today that are really becoming a, a threat to the flock of God. And so, uh, John, I really want to thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it, bro. Yeah, thank you for having me, Josh. I really appreciate you uh, having me on. And uh, so I, I feel like I have to apologize to everyone who's watching real quick. I, I do look a little disheveled here, but uh, I've been working on my bathroom all day, running to Lowe's multiple times. And so I don't know uh, if that maybe that adds to my my credibility here, uh, my <laughs> bivocational identity with the common man. But no, um, I, you know, as, as I'm doing things around my house and uh, working just like all everyone has to do at, at points. Um, I love listening to scripture and listening to podcasts and books. And that's actually, that's where I, I, I do a lot of my thinking. So uh, anyway, you'll forgive me for that, but uh, I appreciate you having me on and I'm looking forward to what we're going to get into today. Yeah, for sure. And I can empathize with you a little bit. I've been keeping up with you and, and saw your, your constant projects there at the house. And you're finally, looks like you're finally getting settled in a little bit. We recently just moved and had to do uh, pretty much the same thing to an old house that we got uh, here in St. Joseph. So I, I, uh, I can understand the the hecticness a little bit of all that. <laughs> but yeah. to the conversation this uh, this day, we are looking at um, this program I've been doing called "You Asked," where I'm just basically taking questions, mostly from people from our church and people who email in. Uh, and trying to provide biblical clarity to some of these questions. And I've received actually uh, several uh, over the past year of people really concerned when they see um, some of some some really mainstream leaders either compromising their doctrine, uh, they're, they're, they're moving into sort of parroting the secular godless cultures, um, uh, you know, talking points. Uh, or, or even morally, we're seeing more and more pastors and leaders uh, fail through sexual immorality or adultery or drugs or mismanagement of funds or unethical behavior. And so I really wanted to just have a conversation about um, some of those roots and some of the things we're seeing. Um, because I believe, and, and John, pipe in here, but I really believe that what ends up infiltrating into the church really starts with a sense of compromise from the top. Uh, Pastors, leaders, elders, um, organizational, spiritual leaders, when they refuse to speak the truth, when they refuse to stay grounded and humbled, um, grounded in God's word, uh, when they stop maintaining their personal integrity, really what they're doing in their in their role is compromising the entire flock. Um, Why would you say, um, what does the Bible teach us about the importance of pastoral integrity and why is it so important especially in this day and age 
Well, yeah, I mean, you'd be familiar with probably going through ordination and everything, the qualifications uh, laid down in scripture multiple times for uh, Titus and Timothy for being um, an elder. And so there, there's a high standard that needs to be met. And, and right now, um, what we're seeing, I think, is something the Bible talks about, but it's, it's um, something that is not unique to Christianity, because we're seeing this in like every single institution that we trust. I mean, uh, I was a Boy Scout growing up, right? Mm-hmm. So you look at what happened to the Boy Scouts and corruption. Uh, but at, so you could say the LGBTQ movement and stuff was part of this, but there was also corruption going on. The two go went hand in hand. And the same thing now um, in, in different forms is happening in just about every civic organization that we've been probably a part of in our lives. Social justice has infiltrated, but also some kind of corruption and uh, a willingness to sacrifice others for oneself and to um, pursue power. And, um, and, and not that that's a wrong thing in and of itself, but to pursue it in ways that are immoral. Uh, to um, sexual immorality being part of this, embezzling money. I mean, these are the kind of scandals we read about, even with famous preachers sometimes that many of us looked up to. So um, I think of like Jude, I think of uh, descriptions of false teachers in the New Testament, but Jude in particular, yeah. where you have false teaching, but you also have immoral behavior. And they, they just kind of run together. And yeah. Uh, and that's been one of the things that has, um, it, it's a chicken egg thing. I, I've wondered about like, okay, what, which started, like, did it, was it the social justice movement and, and, um, false doctrine, uh, maybe before that coming in and then people trying to be pragmatic and bend to the culture, or I should say bend to the world. And, or is it that, you know, they were already corrupt and this was kind of an opportunity to demonstrate that corruption. And I've kind of, I think it's, it's probably corruption from the beginning. Hard times tests uh, men and, and shows who they really are. And yeah. it when, when the going gets tough, uh, people that are true and faithful and built up, as uh, Psalm 1 says, um, by the streams of water, they're, they're firmly rooted. They will remain firmly rooted and they won't waver even when it hurts them, even when they're called names, uh, even when they're lied about and slandered and all the rest of the stuff happens. Uh, those though, who do not have roots and who are there for alternate reasons, they, they want the approval of men like the Pharisees did. They want the chief seats. Uh, they um, just enjoy that sense of, of spiritual authority that they think they have. They're going to try to preserve that and they're going to do whatever it takes to preserve that. And so we see utter hypocrisy across the land right now. Even right now, as we're doing this interview, um, the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict just came in That's and right. not not guilty, right? But all these organizations that claim how much they cared about justice, uh, like the Gospel Coalition, Christianity Today, yeah. the SBC seminaries, the list goes on, and, and people who claim they, you know, last year were so into justice, they, they have nothing to celebrate right now. They have nothing to say. And even I think of Gospel Coalition, they actually slandered Kyle Rittenhouse wow. last summer and said he was this mass murderer. So, um, so you see a hypocrisy that that what they say they value, they don't really value. It's 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 all optics and fashion mm-hmm. and an image that they're trying to um, um, put out there so that you will think of them in a certain way and give them honor. But it's not an honor that's been earned. And yeah. so um, so anyway, yeah. So I, I hope that sort of answers your question to, to some extent or at least gets the conversation started in that yeah. direction. Yeah, but, it, it really does. And um I, I'm seeing this current season, and I realize that we're we're kind of a small chunk of church history. There's been a lot that's gone on um, since the inception of of the church that that is uh, worth worth conversation. But the time we're living in, I f- I feel like this past year has sorted out, so to speak, sifted through, and shown revealed a lot of the hirelings from from the shepherds uh, regarding spiritual leadership uh, within, be it Christian organizations, parachurch organizations, or within the church uh, itself, the local church. And I've been reminded of John chapter 10, where Jesus um, basically says the difference between the hireling and the shepherd is that the hireling doesn't own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf come and he coming, he basically, he, he turns to his own self-interest and leaves the flock scattered and vulnerable to the, the beasts of the field. And and that's what I feel like I'm seeing, you know, that 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 prophetic utterance of Isaiah 56, where uh, God is basically inviting, you know, the beast of the field to come devour 
all his people because the watchmen are blind. They're like dumb dogs. They can't bark. They're sleeping. They're lying down. They're loving to slumber. slumber they're greedy. And he goes on and on. Um, and they're ignorant by saying tomorrow will be as today, right? They're, they're, there's like right. this na naivety, willing ignorance towards the threats that are to the flock. And I'm, I'm, I've been concerned, I mean, even for myself, uh, if I could be vulnerable for a moment as a pastor, I know what it's like to face the temptation of, you know, you all the loudest voices are, are pressuring you uh, just to cave into these talking points or to the latest uh, social fads. Uh, to these egalitarian ideas that are that are really infiltrating at a rapid pace, um, and that temptation to to want to please men, to not want to make anyone upset, but um, and this is something I've appreciated about you is that we talked about Jude, you know Jude in that same breath tells us that we are to earnestly contend for the faith right. that has been been delivered once for for all the saints, and yet there is a compromise that's happening in your mind, what's this all revealing? I mean, what's, what's it exposing of what's going on in the church? The hearts of men, it's just showing um, where we were really at and who the people that are platformed to lead the church, uh, who they are. And they're not, they're not pastors primarily, or they don't have that pastoral heart. They're, uh, they're not shooting the wolves. In fact, they're trying to make peace packs with the wolves and, mm -hmm. Uh, they're not going after lost sheep, really. They are um, intent on just keeping their own power and making sure the sheep uh, keep paying their salaries and those kinds of things. And it's discouraging because it's like, you know, we didn't, at least I didn't think it was quite as bad as it was a few years ago. I knew that things were going in a negative direction in some ways, but I didn't realize it was really as bad as it was. And I think it's, it's good in one sense that we at least know what we're dealing with. Mm. We can see, all right, you know, there, there is, there's a remnant, they're faithful, they're there. Um, but there's a whole lot of people that are deceived. And of course you have your, your, you know, in between people who are kind of, um, falling into this, but ha you know, aren't, they, they may be solid Christians and believers, but they're, they're, uh, their ears are being tickled and they're, um, they're, they're going with it at least to some extent. Uh, but the, the leaders are, that, that's what I focus primarily on, are those pushing false gospels, false teaching uh, in the church, um, in evangelical organizations. And I'd say most of the leaders, and I hate to be that dismal, but it really is like the majority of the evangelical industrial complex is uh, in this social justice vein. And um, totally fine with, with false teaching and false gospels, even, uh, much of the time. And, uh, so when we recognize it, it's discouraging at first, but I think it, it also reminds me of how God, um, how Jesus taught that there are wheat and there are tares. And that if you look at even the problems in the early church, how much of it was false teachers coming in unaware, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. subversively coming in. Uh, and you read a revelation, you know, the church is at the beginning of revelation and all it's nothing new under the sun. And that's what I like to tell people is that this is, it's not a surprise. This is, this is how the, the heart of man, man operates. It's mm -hmm. deceptive. It seeks its own. And, yeah. um, so we have to be discerning and vigilant, point out these things to others because we love people. We don't want that's them right. going for these evil ideas and, and, and false gospels. Yeah. And, and I've, I've, you know, I've, I've shared and, and um, brought to light some things even in our church. And uh, sometimes, you know, I think, I think people get the wrong impression. I don't know if maybe it's just my personality, but uh, that somehow, somehow it, it excites me or it gets me giddy to, to point out a false teacher or false doctrine. Uh, quite the contrary. I mean, I think of Paul saying, it's 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 with much tears that I have to say this, you know, it's with weeping that I have to say that they're that these people have become enemies of the cross of Christ. And, right. you know, this isn't about about being ugly or critical. This is about the the high cost and the high uh, what's at stake, really, in regards to truth. Um, I, I think of Paul's exhortation to a young pastor, Timothy, where he told Timothy, take heed to yourself and to your doctrine, for in doing so, you will both save yourself and those hearing you. So the stakes are really high um, for pastors not to be simply sheep who are led and swayed by every wind of doctrine. I mean, that should be every Christian, but um, pastors need to, and spiritual leaders need to lead the way in really paying attention to Absolutely. their potential errors, uh, their fallacies, their need to grow 
uh, their need to be transformed by the truth and the word of God, uh, because I think there's just too much at stake for for us not to be doing those types of things. And, Absolutely. And and I, I read this portion in your book, um, and I thought it was really insightful. And and if I'm if I'm perhaps reading it wrong, just jump in and, and correct me on this. But you in 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 your intro. And in your opening chapters, um, you give this really history of so, of the social justice movement, and you seem to even imply that in some of the 19th century theology and, and among the theologians today, there was really a, almost a building block within religion that Marxism grabbed hold of and grasped onto and started to take some of the, as I think you called it, the templates of, of Christian thought and then interjecting its own definitions and godless thoughts in, into it. Um, can you maybe unpack that a little bit? How did the church yeah. play into where we got today and are the same dangers still in play? Yeah, well, Francis Schaeffer called Marxism a Christian heresy. And it, which is, you know, that would be a term we think of like for Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or something. But he said, no, this is uh, this is the same kind of thing, because and, and, and the reason he said that was because Marx uh, or the way Marxism works is it, it values the individual. Now, of course, it values the collective. That's it's it's a bunch of individuals together into this collective that actually dehumanizes people. But it starts and this is where it grabs you emotionally on this like you care about people though don't you don't you love people right and and so we just take that for granted in the west like hey you should you should like love people you should engage in charitable things you should try to 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 better the 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 uh lots of others right loving your neighbor this kind of thing well that's not necessarily a given and that's what francis schaefer was arguing like that's actually something kind of unique to cultures that had been shaped by christianity so the west and so that's where Marxism first arose. Now, you could say that Marxism has been in some ways more successful in non-Western places, hmm. but classical Marxism, perhaps, even cultural Marxism like in China. But I think um, it's been perhaps delayed in, in Europe and in the United States. It's come, it's just been more progressively introduced. And I think, um, and, and so part of that is, Christ, so Christianity uh, is something that uh, is a barrier to Marxism because it actually, it, it, Marxism is totally adverse to the Christian's conception of reality and justice uh, and its metaphysics, it, just everything. It just There's yeah. so many things it's, it's adverse to, but there's also this kind of echo of Christianity in it. So especially as the society secularizes, people who are, uh, they're kind of, they, they walked away from the church or their parents did. And, you know, it was grandma and grandpa's thing, religion, but they're not really in there. There's still kind of this afterglow of Christianity in our habits. We can't avoid that. We grow up and we're taught certain ways of thinking. Even if we didn't go to church, there, there is sort of this, this memory that we have uh, that's been passed down to us. And Marxism kind of takes advantage of that by, by sort of corrupting the golden rule, but giving you a sense of it. And, mm. Uh, and then, so I, I have a section where I, I show the parallels uh, between today's social justice and um, and, and Christianity, and how uh, conversion and our concept of even inspired texts and um, our concept of um, providence, and you, you know, down to even religious rituals like gathering for w purposes of worship and things. Mm. These things are all paralleled in the social justice movement. And it's always pretty much been that way. It just takes on different forms over time. And so we had the same kind of thing with the social gospel movement in some ways. We had it with liberation theology, to some extent, the German Christian movement in Nazi Germany. There were elements of this. Um, we saw it with in, in the new left movement in the 1970s. I wrote a whole book about this. And, and then today we have with, with the woke church, just a repackaging of these same ideas. You, you yeah. change, you tweak a little here, you tweak a little there, but at the root of all of it is this um, kind of Marxist goal of creating a heaven on earth, right? This, this utopia of sorts where there's equity, inclusion, diversity of some kind, uh, destroying any of the institutions that would prevent that from taking place, whether mm -hmm. it's family, church, uh, labor relationships, and then um, creating a centralized authority to replace God that's going to end up um, carrying out this work and making it possible. 
that's carried through every iteration of the social justice movement pretty much. Uh, there, there, I don't, I can't think of any exceptions to this. Yeah. And so, um, there's, th this could only have really arisen uh, at least organically in a Christian society where they start with valuing man and start with the golden rule is important and Christian ethics, the Christian ethics without Christian metaphysics, epistemology, without the Bible, without its teaching, you just sort of have this Christian ethic, then there's nothing to ground it in. And I think that's how Marxism kind of arose, at least part of, part of the picture there. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I uh, as you were as you were talking, I I thought about um, the picture of 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 Judas. Uh, you might remember that event at at Bethany where Mary was uh, took her expensive perfume and she's washing the feet of Jesus, right, um, and anointing his feet, and and Judas brings up this argument that you know that could have been sold for 300 denarii and we could have given the money to the poor, but he really wanted the money for himself, and 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 just that picture of um of of a social justice front but at the at the root of it is this greed this selfishness and really i think he typifies satan in that story of um of of covering this you know making this cover of social justice and uh inclusion and equity and compassion and using all these terms to as a front but really what it is, is, is we want, he wants to take worship away from Jesus. He wants to get people to try to feel like they're doing something good um, apart from Christ. And uh, what I think what, what troubles me the most is how many Christians, hook, line, and sinker, have bought into this without even thinking twice about what's a real message here, what's spiritually, what's happening behind the scenes. Right. Um, and it's happening again like i said from the top from the top down i i don't know if you saw that interview recently vadi bakum uh, and rashad ritchie kind of got into yeah, it on i this actually interview. did see that yeah and and uh you know it, it it exemplified to me this this contrast where rashad ritchie takes this uh parable of the lost sheep and he says see the one sheep that Jesus, that the shepherd goes after, that's black people, you know, and, and the 99 is everyone else. And so this is, this is why we emphasize this. And, you know, Vadi just calling him out, you, you are taking some, uh, God's word, you're, you're eviscerating it, and you're putting your own message into the context of the passage. Uh, I mean, this is going on a lot these days, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That's kind of the modus operandi of the social justice movement in Christianity. They, and by the way, it's not just Christianity. When it goes into other religions, they do the same thing where they take the, the sacred text and what it says, and then uh, they, they try to cherry pick or slip in their own meanings. And the devil has been doing this, you know, since the beginning of time with Day God's one, word. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of his thing. So um, th that shouldn't surprise any of us. You just have to know the word of God uh, well. And then when these things are brought up, be able to go to the word of God and have at least the rudimentary tools to figure out, okay, what was the author saying? What, what is this actually trying to communicate? Um, and it, every time you're, you'll find out it's not exactly what the social justice warriors want you to think it, it is saying. So um, there's so many passages they do this with, but um, classically and lately, uh, in studying like the um, progressive evangelicals of the 70s, I, I, it's weird to say this, but they were a little more sophisticated sometimes in the passages that they would use. I, fe I felt they made stronger arguments. They were wrong. Today, it, it's so intellectually lazy. It's like, let's take a verse from the Old Testament that has the word justice in it and slip in all our conceptions of what justice should be yeah. under that term, because it says justice. So it must mean the same thing that we mean by it. And, and those terms, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, they 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 don't exist in a vacuum. There there's limitations to them. There's definitions to them. There's um, they have a context in which they're applied, and the social justice movement tends to just be very abstract, divorce these things of any kind of uh, rootedness in a context or a person who would define them, and then they subversively just impose their own uh, idea of what those things should mean without really telling you that's what they're doing. And so they become the authorities. They become God in a sense. So we believe a lot of those, those terms, these are good terms. Justice is a great term. Equity, yeah. I mean, you find that throughout the Old Testament, right? But these are things that God has placed limitations on and he gets to define. 
And, um, and he does so in a way that's actually good for us because we're his creation, right? There's creation norms here. And we have to uh, take those into account. We have to take into account what's actually best for people, not just status, but actually quality of life. Uh, and, and, um, so, you know, people could be equally miserable and it's, it's equality. Isn't this great? (laughs) Well, no, not really. Like that, that's what socialism always brings you. Like that's not, it's not great, you know? Um, and there's no system that will give you everyone's rich, right? So you're going to have to settle for something in which those who, uh, there's going to be a certain class of people. Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you that are going to be in need of charity. And there's going to also be people that might need their decisions limited in some way, like criminals, uh, people who have a hard time taking care of themselves. I mean, there's, we have disabilities. There's all kinds of limitations that are baked into the fabric of reality. And what Christians have done is they've rushed into plagues um, and they've set up hospitals yeah. and they've tried the, as best they can to engage in charity and help these things. What the Christian social justice warriors today want to do, though, they say that's not enough. That in fact, even those efforts were probably racist in some way or sexist or something. We we need a, a one size fits all top down system that's going to uh, create this egalitarian equality that flatlines everything. Yeah. And and that way we're all gonna you know enjoy some kind of a measure of utopia here on earth. It'll never happen. And 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 that's that's the the Achilles heel of this whole thing. It just denies the created world that we live in. And every time it's tried, you, you see negative results. And, yeah. Uh, and, and, so. and what I guess, I guess I shouldn't be confused. I mean, there's a lot of theological laziness and I, I don't say this um, uh, in suggesting somehow that any of us have fully arrived to a, a perfect knowledge of the scriptures or of God. But I mean, the Bible offers us a better story, <laughs> a better truth. I mean, Jesus is coming back one day. It's what every Christian is to believe. He's going to establish his kingdom. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. He's going to to bring about um, everything that that this everything that everyone says they're wanting in all these things. Jesus is is bringing one day, and he's told us that now is a different time. It's a different. It's it's a time where his kingdom is within us. We are preaching the gospel. We're living as light, as salt in the earth. We're, we're telling the truth. We're going to face persecution and tribulation in this world, but to be of good cheer for he's overcome the world. And yet so many Christians today are, are buying into this, this lie that somehow we're going to make it all, uh, that, that the world without Christ is going to make it all right again. And, um, it, it confuses me a little bit when the Bible offers us the actual, the true and better story in the gospel. Yeah. Well, most of us don't think about what we're actually imbibing. Sometimes we're just going through life and we see, I mean, how many people are scroll through their phones and see like, oh, that's a nice video. That's a nice song. That's a nice whatever. And that that becomes one of their interests or something that they pursue. But without thinking about it, it just the presentation and the wrapping paper just looks sparkly. And and that's, I think, a lot of the appeal for the social justice movement is that they're not. Now, some people are, and those are very dangerous people, but most people, I, I, I think, aren't thinking through all the ramifications of this and what actually at the end of the day this is going to do and what it means. They're, they're more like just, well, you know, of course I want everyone in the world to uh, have a full bellies and we, we, no one should be starving, right? Sure. Don't we all want that? Yeah. So it, let's accept this solution, which claims to, to somehow make this reality possible, which we know it can't. And they're just not the right hand isn't, isn't looking at what the left hand's doing. And so they can adopt these contradictions. And, um, and so, you know, how, how do you fight that? How do you prepare people? You have to, it starts, I think on the local church level, the family level, uh, parents need to be invested in what their kids are learning at school and they need to be training them in the Mm -hmm. ways of God and not just giving them the Bible, but actually applying it. Here's what it looks like. And these principles look like, uh, in our context, this is what it means. Um, And obviously pastors like yourself, I'm sure you're doing a great job doing this, but we need to uh, preach the word unapologetically and then apply it to the current situations of the day. That sounds controversial. It sounds scary. Most pastors won't do it, but how else are the people in the pew going to know how to use their Bible? It's a sword. It's meant to cut stuff. Yeah. So, uh, so that's the solution. It's not a, a hard one. It's a simple one. It's been around for a long time, but it's just not used very often. Now, switching gears just just a little bit, um, 
I'm thinking of the people because I had a conversation with a guy and, and I really appreciated his honesty where he was coming from. And he, he was like, I'm just so discouraged. I see, I see so, so much confusion among pastors that I'm supposed to respect. <laughs> and, and, and this guy says this, and this guy says this. And, and then, you know, as we look at, at, at just sort of history, just in the recent history where we have the Jimmy Swaggerts and the Ted Haggards and, and even all the way to, to Ravi Zachari Zacharias, who obviously isn't here to speak for himself, but there's, there's some, something going on there. And then you have, uh, then you have, um, a crew, and then you have Tim Keller and uh, Russell Moore, and, and all of a sudden everyone's sort of slightly changing their message, and then this guy's contradicting this guy, and then MacArthur's saying this. And I mean, I think people are getting confused and weary and tired. Some, sadly, to the point of saying, "I I just give up. I don't I don't yeah. I don't know if I can trust this altogether." What's your word to those people who are? who are floating out there, confused, discouraged, trying to just find uh, their anchor in Christ, but are really having a, a hard time with that. I mean, where do they start? Let me start by relating because I'm with that crowd in some ways. When, <laughs> when this whole thing started, I, and, and I, it started for me much earlier than it did for most people because I was sitting in seminary watching these ideas uh, really be forced in, onto the students in, in some cases. And, uh, taught at least to them. And I just was, I, I, I was a little older than some of the other students and I could recognize what was happening because I had already been to secular undergrad school and uh, in, in, in a liberal area, nonetheless. So I, I knew this was Marxism. I had teachers who would literally tell you I'm a Marxist. They were actually honest about it, which was nice. Uh, and then I started hearing these same ideas at seminary. And so I thought, okay, this isn't good, and, but I, I, this must be unique to my situation. This must be what's happening at Southeastern. This can't be happening other places. I mean, no one would stand for it. And I thought, surely, like someone like an Al Mohler, he would never go for this, right? Yeah. This is going to all be shut down real quick. And then MLK 50 happened. And we were given uh, the option, at least at the seminary, of, of getting credits to even go to the, just showing up at the conference and writing a paper, essentially. Uh, and then T4G happened and David Platt gave this, this yeah. crazy sermon and uh, Mark Dever did this crazy panel on MLK 50. And, um, and, and it was obvious now to the, the wider world, what was happening. And, and so for me, like that was, that, that was like hitting concrete. Cause I thought, okay, some of these guys I respected, I thought they were going to put an end to all of this when they found out about it. They just didn't know. And then I found out, wow, some of these guys were the actual ones behind what was happening. They, wow. they were in total agreement with it. And, th and that was very discouraging for me at first. And I remember this time. So I, I don't know if I've ever shared this actually publicly before. I was uh, just came to me, though. I, I was at seminary and all this stuff had just happened. Like it was fresh and I wasn't seeing the pushback. It was like James White on the dividing line was like, hey, something weird is happening. And like hardly anyone else was saying anything. And I went to um, I went to a local lake. There's a there's a beautiful lake by the seminary I was at. And I took a walk. You know, it was a beautiful day just by myself. And I opened the scripture and I just started reading because I, I was like, Lord, I want an answer to this. Um, and uh, so I came to a section of, of Jesus. And, and actually, I'm going to look it up because I want to, to read it. It's Matthew yeah. 23. Um, and it really encouraged me. And I, you might wonder like, oh, how, how could this encourage you? But uh, it's the woes to the scribes and Pharisees. And so he, yeah. he starts describing them. And when he describes them, I thought this is exactly what I'm seeing at my seminary, mm -hmm. like to a T. It's like mm -hmm. he, he was right there watching what I was watching. And um, he says that, that, you know, they've seated themselves in the chair of Moses. So there's, there's this respect they kind of have, but what they do is they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on people's shoulders and they're, they're unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. They do all their deeds to be noticed by other people, hmm. for they brought in their phylacteries. They lengthen the tassel of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets, the seat of honor in the synagogues and personal greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by the people. But as for you, do not be called rabbi. So, so he, he warns them not to be like this. Uh, but then he goes on with, and just rips them to shreds in this whole thing. And, but, and, and that's the moment I thought, okay, that's what's going on. Like at the end of the day, it's, it's not Marxism as much as it is um, trying to be loved 
mm. by the wrong set, set of individuals and wow. doing it for the wrong motives. It's the motives at the end of the day. And that's what's causing all of this. Uh, there's calculations going on with uh, who do I say something about what's going on over there? Do I mention that person's name? I don't know. I might get disinvited from a conference or lose a book deal or someone will be mad at me and that might be uncomfortable. That, that's the, if those calculations are going on in someone's mind, which let's face it, we all have that temptation at times, then the, what's happening is you're, you're being like the Pharisees. You're loving the approval of men. And, and that's the chief thing to you instead of the approval of God. And so yeah. I, I'm just convinced now this is years downstream from, from that uh, event that w the vast majority of what calls itself evangelical is, is actually more in the category of where the Pharisees were and slipping more towards that, that category all day and every day because there's uh, an inability to recognize a uh, false teaching that's taking place and actually confront it. So, yeah, and I always encourage people, you know, be careful who you listen to, be careful the voices you allow in. Um, there is a quality uh, to, to, to truth that is recognizable. There's a quality to, to lies that are, even though it's very deceptive and sometimes hard to discern. And, um, and most importantly, uh, just, Man, stay as close as you can to the Word of God. Hide it in your heart. Meditate on it day and night. Um, stay close to stay close to Jesus in your in your own personal prayer life. I mean, these are the things that, regardless of all the voices out there, that we know we can do to keep ourselves grounded uh, in the truth of of Christ. Um, John, maybe maybe if you could give one word of exhortation uh, or encouragement to pastors out there who are feeling the tension. Um, feeling the temptation, uh, uh, maybe even in a sense right now, uh, are afraid to to speak out some truth because of who they might offend or what they might say. Um, I, I recently did a podcast with another pastor on this passage where Jesus says, "Do not think I've come to bring peace, but a sword." And we kind of, whoa, right. you know, that's is that the is that the meek and lowly, mild Jesus that we think of? And yet Jesus says there's an element to his truth and his nature and his character that divides even the closest relationships, and that that uh, those things shouldn't factor into what we say and, and what we believe and what we propagate. Uh, what's your word to, to pastors out there who are in the trenches? Think of heaven. Just, just stop. You know, if you ever have the temptation to cave or you, you start wondering even because we naturally do that, what will others think? Just stop right there and start thinking about judgment day. Think about heaven. Think about the eternal things. And then uh, make your decision in front of the court of heaven and not the court of men. Yeah. And then um, and then stick with it. Don't yeah. waver from it, even when the tempest grows strong. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, there, there's been several opportunities within the last year to do just that. And uh, if, you, if you've caved in some of these other uh, situations, you know, maybe you shut your church down for a lengthy period of time. And, you know, it was to you basically... People aren't able to use their spiritual gifts. You're forsaking the assembling of the saints. If you've gone along with the BLM narrative, if, I mean, there, there's any number of things, then just repent of it. Just repent. It's easy. It's just, Lord, hey, forgive me. I'm so sorry. This was evil. I, I did this. And I want to do things for a different motive, not for men, but for you. And um, look, I do that every day on smaller on a smaller level yeah. because we all tend to do that. We're selfish. We're, we're, we have pride and we have to fight it constantly. Um, also remember this, that the devil is real and there yeah. are demonic influences out there. And so when you aren't, if something sounds off to you, if, if you're not sure if a teacher's uh, really solid, um, it, it, there's also a deceiver who knows the word of God much better, even in some ways than we do. I mean, he's been around longer. He's seen some of these events firsthand. And uh, the battle's not against flesh and blood, but flesh and blood is often open to the, the devil's influence. And so remember to put your armor on and, yeah. and that's the battle we're fighting. It's a spiritual battle. That's a good word, man. And I feel like our conversation just started, but uh, I'm going to wrap it up to bring it to an end. Um, I really want to thank you for coming on. I appreciate your ministry and we're going to try to keep encouraging people to uh, subscribe to your, to your material and get the word out. Um, thank you for doing such a, a, an excellent job at really thinking, being very thoughtful and biblically minded on these things, John. And, and I really appreciate again, you joining me today. Yeah, my pleasure. I appreciate it, Joshua. Okay. God bless you, man. Bye. Bye now.